turn to Romans. And a uh, quick question. Um, does anyone have life all figured out? Paul? Paul? Uh, okay. No. Even, even the, the, the older generation that is more mature, you know, you guys don't have it all figured out? Okay. Does anybody have any issues in their life? Okay, okay. I, uh, we, can, we can answer that one. My boys raised their hand. I hope they're looking at me for the issues. <laughs> No, we, we, we struggle, right? Uh, um, it's part of our life. Uh, I saw this on Facebook. I think, I think Kitty shared it. Uh, about why we are here. You now, there was Tim Keller. The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. Yeah. Um, we, we, we don't come here to put ourselves on display and look at how great we are. We're here to come and say, this is my life. You know, and here's my struggles. Here's my praises. Um, but here we are. You know, that's even why it's it's, oops, it's one of the core values of our church. On the very top blip, you know, we uh, we we serve we uh, we we seek to bring Christ-centered love and service in our community by being rooted in biblical truth and worshiping authentically, and that. That is huge in my book. Worshiping authentically. Um, and I guess I'm just not meaning singing uh, authentically, but I mean in your life you're being authentic. You're being true. Uh, not only to God, because he already knows anyway, um, but to, to yourself and to people around you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the uh, pasted on su Sunday smile, right? Of Inside, you're dying inside, but as soon as you come to the doors, you feel like you have to put the smile on. That's, that, that, that isn't authentic. Um, we are here to help one another. Um, and taste passage that we're getting to in Romans, it's just so, so spot on. <laughs> um, this is one of those passages, I'll be honest, it just appreciates itself. I could just read it and be done. Um, it's so great, and it's not... Really, you know, it doesn't have a lot of deep parts to it to really dive in, but it's just so good about Paul being real about his struggle with sin in his life as he's been, of course, you know, going um, through this letter of, of Paul, and, he, and he's going to just be authentic with the people he's writing to in Rome, saying, "Hey, I this is my struggles with sin as well," um, and it's just such a good passage. So, let's look there. There's Romans 7. And we're going to start up in verse 13. Of course, chapter 7. He's, he's looking at the, the influence of the law. You know, the Mosaic law. Or God's, God's commands. And how that relates um, to sin. How that relates to how we should act. Um, and, and, and we've been building on that. And it's been... Showing that, you know, even though, you know, we, the, the law was brought in to increase sin, but it, it's not saying that the law was sin itself, it's just that we sin we, 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 when we know what is right and wrong, right? We, we, we like to push those boundaries once we know something, there's something we're not supposed to be doing. <laughs> when your mom said, don't touch that hot pan, what did you do as a kid? You touched it. <laughs> you, you pushed that boundary. And that's what the rule of God's law is. Um, and he's continuing to build on that and, and, and telling us how we are to live in light of that we're not right with God. Um, so let's pick it up in verse 13. Let me pray as I get there. Father, as we come to your holy word, I, I just praise you for what you've been teaching and molding in me. And Father, I, I, I pray just for your spirit. I have to be moving among us, Lord, to help us focus right now. And Lord, may it be sharply in our so may it change us and mold us in how we think and how we feel and what we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So starting in verse uh, 13, actually I want to pick it up in uh, verse 12, because um, actually back to verse 7, <laughs> I keep backing up, sorry. Uh, verse 7, kind of picking up, you know, Paul has these rhetorical questions he likes to use. Verse 7, he says, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? Uh, by no means. Um, in respect to, you know, is the law sin because it brought sin in? No, it's, 
It brought it in. For, it's not sin just because it just defined what was wrong. Um, and then he picks it up in uh, his argument through 7 through uh, 12, which we covered last week. So I'm going to pick it up in verse 12, which is his, his, his culmination statement uh, about his argument. But then we'll pick it up and finish out the chapter. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Now picking up verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I, I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Great words. Picking back up in verse 13, where he says, That which is good, then, bring death to me. I will admit, when I first was reading this and studying this, I totally read this wrong and let my mid-American uh, culture influence how I read this. Because it says, that which is good then bring death to me. So I was like, wait, what, what is good? And I'm talking about the good, good within ourselves, you know, what we hear in culture, right? Well, there's good. But that's not what he's talking about. I read verse 12 on purpose. So we see, because what, what are the, some of the uh, words he just used to describe the law? Holy, righteous, and good. So he's taking that, instead of saying the law again, he's using the last word he, he gave about the law, good. And then he says, did that which is good, the law, then bring death to me? So did, so did God's law bring death to me? And, and he's linking it back, if you go back up to verse uh, you know, 7 through 9, that you know, he's talking about is the law sin. Um, and then he talks about, um, you know, how uh, that sin came alive with the commandment. So he's like, you know, oh, I'm not saying that um, it was the law that brought death to me. And he says, by no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, the law in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. He, he's continuing, he kind of repeats himself from before, uh, to link in here. That it wasn't God's law that brought death, it, it, it's, it's sin. But the law was used that was good in order to show what was sin. And it was sinful beyond measure. It is sin. And now he's going to pick up a new thought going up here into verse 14. He says, but we know that the law is spiritual. It's, it's spiritual of God. You know, that's what he's saying. The, the, the law is, is of God. 
but I am of the flesh. Sold under sin. Now flesh, kind of a, a common thing with Paul, whenever you see that word flesh, he's talking about the, our, our sinful nature, our fallen bodies. He's talking about or uh, um, the sin. But we are, but he's saying, I, I am of the flesh. I, I am degenerate. I, I, I am sinful. Um, I am sold under sin, right? And it's kind of talking about like being sold uh, as a slave to sin. And that goes back to chapter 6 when he was talking about how, you know, we're, we're going to serve a higher power. We're either going to serve God or we're going to serve sin. And so he's saying here, you know, our, our initial state is God's word, God's commands are of God. And, and they're, they're spiritual, they're holy, they're good, they're righteous. But we are of the flesh. We are fallen. We are under the yoke of sin. We are slaves to sin. And he picks it back up in verse 40, uh, 15. And here he's, written, and he's going to spend the next few verses talking about his, his battle to obey God's command within him. That's, so first we're going to see that in our battle to obey God's command, we struggle to do what God's word tells us. Verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions. Well, that's, I love these statements here because at least I can identify with about everything he's saying here. It's so just real and authentic of what he's saying. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Anyone ever agree with that statement? <laughs> Man, Paul, thank you for saying that. I can identify with that. He doesn't understand why he's doing it. You know, it's you know, like when you ask a, a little kid and who doesn't even really know what's going on, but they did something wrong, and they ask, well, what did you do wrong? Why did you do that? And they go, well, I don't know. I just wanted to do it. They don't have a rational explanation. That's kind of how he's feeling. He says, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, this statement, you know, you, you've probably heard other people talk about it, you know, someone who's trying to be good and moral. Uh, but I don't think he, this statement is, is applied to Christians. He's talking about himself. He, he knows the word of God, <laughs> but he struggles to follow it. But the very thing I hate, he does not want to do stuff against the Word of God. But he is. He continues on in verse 16. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that is good. Now, that's, uh, this hate statement here is just saying, you know, that even if he's doing what he doesn't want, you know, doing things he hates, he, he, he's, his actions don't affect that the law is still good. Right? Because God's, the law is of God. It's spiritual. His actions don't change what the law is. So he's saying, even though I struggle to do what's right, even though I, I, I don't do what I'm supposed to, the law is still good. God's commands are still good for us. It's the law that makes him wrestle with it. <laughs> right? Without the law, he, he wouldn't have this conflict. He'd say, oh, well, you know, but you just give in to it. But it's the law that, that is actually the, the one that brings in this struggle. He doesn't want to give in, and he's wrestling with it. Give me on in 17. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And we talked about this before. In this section of when, of when he, he, he says it, it's sin doing it. Remember, he, he, he's not saying that he's like saying, okay, I'm not responsible for it because it's sin's fault. It's not my fault. No, that's not his point. He, everywhere else in Romans, he makes it abundantly clear. We're responsible for our own sin. But what he's, he, during the section, he's trying to show, uh, in, in essence, two forces going on in your life. You have the, the God wanting to work in your life, and you have God's Word working in your life. And on the other hand, we have sin working in our life. 
And here, and even uh, in the next couple of verses, we'll get to talking about the sin dwelling in us. And that should uh, have us call, remember, the, the spirit dwelling in us. So, so he, he, he's using sin, not, not, not to say it's sin's fault, but he's using it as an illustration that we can serve two things. God or sin, and, and those things are just that tension and battle in our lives. And when we wrestle with it, he's, he's giving it, it's sin that is making him do it. It's sin dwelling within him. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. He says, nothing good dwells in me, that is, my flesh. <laughs> the key part is flesh, referring to our fallen nature, our fallen side. Uh, and even, if you remember, uh, we were talked about back when we talked about the 40 questions about heaven and hell. Biblically, they, they, uh, they, there's two sides, two, two parts to our being. We have uh, our spirit side. Right, which is our mind, our emotions, our thought, our, our passions, whatever. But then we have our physical side, our actual body. And, right? and so here he, he's talking about there's nothing good in me, and he's talking about in the flesh. In, in, in this body, there is nothing good, because it is overrun uh, with sin. And he says, for I have the desire to do what is right, and where does desire come from? It comes from the spirit side. And, and that's the part uh, that when you're saved, it's the spirit side uh, that exists for eternity. It's the spirit side that drives that desire. That's, that's your, your thinking. That's your emotions. He has that desire to do what is right, but he doesn't have the ability to carry it out because of his fallen fleshly body. He struggles with it. Man, I can continue to identify with what he's saying. Verse 19, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. He's restating his point from back in verse 15. He, he's just defining it again and restating it. He, he wants to prove a point. He, when he has so much repetition in this section, he's saying I know what I want to do. I, I desire to do, but I just can't stand to do it. Now, the verse 20, now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Another repetition from before. He wants to draw a line here to get you to understand. We can understand but how much in our lives that do we know God's word and we want to do it, but we, it's just a struggle. It's a continual battle in our lives. <laughs> really, from the, from the moment of salvation on, uh, we're, we're at battle to do what God is calling us uh, to do. And so this section is so amazing for us that Paul gives us this authentic look into his life. But he, he, he's going to get a little deeper here as we continue on. In verse 21, it says, Now I find it to be a law. Now, when you have a law, he's not talking about the Mosaic law. And here he's talking about, you know, I, I find it to be a general principle uh, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Isn't that a true statement? <laughs> I don't know how many times like I, I've I felt the you know the conviction from God to change something in my life and, and bring it on you know and bring about change okay uh, I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it uh, <laughs> what happens it's like sin is a you know you know this evil's land right there and trying to derail that plan of trying to do the right thing and he's saying yeah I, I, Paul understands that when we want to do what is right when we want to follow God's word. Sin is right there, knocking on the door, wanting to derail that. And he's going to give us more specifics here in verse 22. He's going to let us know that we want to follow God's law in our spirits, in our innermost being, in our minds, in our emotions. And he's been hinting at this 
uh, throughout this passage. Pick up verse 22. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. In his emotions, in his mind, he delights. Remember, Paul is a, you know, he, he's a student of the word. From five years old, he, he's been studying God's word and memorizing it. I mean, he knows it. He, he delights in it. It's a good thing. Verse 23, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, referring again to the inner being, the spirit, and this thinking that God's law that is lodged in his mind, if I should be doing this, there's a war going on with himself against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. It's a battle here. I want to make sure we understand this battle is only because we're saved. Only those who, who, who have the Spirit within them can truly delight in God's law and delight in God's Word. And we have to study it to know it. We have to study something to delight in it. And Paul definitely has, and we need to too. We, we, we need to find our delight in the law and cling to it. It's that delight, it's, it's that, that clinging to the law, clinging to God's word, that is what's standing firm in this struggle that we have. That's standing against this war that sin is waging against us. We cannot win the war on sin on our own. Minds that, that aren't transformed by our relationship with Christ. But we have to want to follow God's word, and that becomes through relationship with God. And he continues on in verse 24 to show that we are inhibited by our sinful flesh. We are inhibited by our sinful bodies. There's a war making him captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Wretched man that I am. And he continues to struggle. Wretched man that we are that We start watching a certain movie and start seeing some things, and our mind is saying, you better turn that off, but our eyes are going, oh, no, we're not turning that off. When we're on the internet and something pops up and our mind goes, flee, run from it. But our temptation goes, no, run to it. When we fight in our addictions and we, and, we, and we know we need to stop, we need to break free from addictions. But yet it doesn't stop us. Those of us who struggle with worry and, and in our minds we know, man, I shouldn't be worrying about this. Why am I so anxious about this? God is in control. Why, why, why? But what do we do? We worry, even when we know we shouldn't. Why am I so angry at this person when I know it shouldn't be? It's such a true matter of man. I just want to, I just want to cling hold of this anger. You know, God's word tells us to let it go, to forgive it. Wretch people that we are. Who? will deliver us from this body of death. Who, who would want us? That even though we know it is right, no, we know what we should be doing, we don't do it. There's only one answer. Thanks be to God, to Jesus Christ our Lord. It's Jesus. He's the only one. <laughs> 
that would deliver me, deliver us from this body of death. And he continues on. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He's Paul saying this, this is the state he's currently in. That's the state he's, he's, he's struggling. This is where he finds himself raging this war within himself. This acknowledgement of how he feels. But what, what he's not seeing here is that this is the ideal. This is the accepted stance. Is that it's, it's okay to let your members that your different parts of your body serve the law of sin. As long as I serve it in my mind. And why isn't it? We'll go back to chapter 6, what we've covered. Is why, if it's okay to allow sin to rule in your members, then why did Paul say in chapter 6, verse 2? How can we, we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Jump down to verses 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and have been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. So how can Paul here say, we've been set free from sin? It's not, or it has no dominion over. We are slaves to righteousness, we're slaves to God instead. Why is he then saying, oh, with the law of God I serve my mind, but by flesh I serve the law of sin. He's not saying this is the prescribed method here at the end of chapter 7. This is just, just an acknowledgement of the step of growing in Christ. Chapter 6 says there, sin has no dominion over you. But there's still a war going on. And that's all that chapter 7 talks about. It's saying it's a step. Now, I'm going to give a sneak peek in the next week. And this is right, man. This is a hard message because the real solution is in chapter 8. <laughs> to what's going on here? So I'm going to give a sneak peek into what he's talking about. So in this war that we have, waging for our, our, what we know God wants us to do, we, we've read it in his word, the Spirit's convicting us, but yet, man, I'm still in the stinking sin and you do it over and over, and, can, and we're struggling with oh, oh, oh. Chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who in Christ Jesus. This is probably a verse you've heard before. It's, it's uh, a lot of times used uh, on the Romans road when you're presenting the gospel. But here in this context, what is it saying? That in our lives, when we know what we're supposed to do, but yet we let sin reign, and as we were saying earlier, Satan and the enemy of our sin is just trying to pile on the guilt. <laughs> Look what you're you did. just gave him the sin. <laughs> you're so guilty. What does God's word say? There is no condemnation for those who are Christ Jesus. So in this war that we fight, when we struggle and we give in to sin, there's no condemnation. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. There's the reminder again that the, that the end of chapter 7 is not the ideal. It's not what we should just settle for. Okay, I'll serve God as much as I can. I'm, I, I just know I'm always going to be in sin. No! We need to push through that and say, no, we've been set free from sin. I shouldn't sit here and just wallow in sin because guess what? I'm going to be in it. No! We push forward. 
There's so much more here to come in Romans. I love because he goes from here in chapter 7 of, of saying there's this war and, and my, my, there are parts of my body that just wants to sin. My eyes, my hands, my, you know, in my mind sometimes when I want to start thinking certain thoughts or get mad at people or gossiping. You know, and there's a war going on. It seems like almost like split personalities sometimes. But sin has no dominion. But guess what? That's not how it's supposed to be. Because let's flip to Romans 12. A verse you've probably heard. But in context of this, this war raging, uh, of this split alliance, you know, this split uh, uh, knowledge of power in our lives, what does Romans 12 tell us? Starting at verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to be sent your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That is to say, you're only presenting our minds, our innermost beings, because that's all that's good enough to... No, it says bodies. That's an all-inclusive term there. So we are... To not let sin continue to rule in our members because our entire bodies should be presented to God as a holy sacrifice. He continues in verse 2 Do not be conformed to this world, be transformed of the unity of your mind. But what we discovered in chapter 7 is that put a new look on chapter 12. But the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We will always be in sin in these folk fallen and broken bodies. But does it mean we need to let it rain in our bodies? Yes, there's a battle going on, but don't let it rain. You were a child of God. It's, oh man, we get to chapter 8. There's so many good verses that are just so powerful of who we are in Christ. That sin does not have dominion over you. Do not wallow in it. Do not let it control you. You are a child of God set free from sin to glorify Him and to offer your bodies holy and complete, not just a portion at a time, but everything we are, we offer to God. To His glory and honor. That's what we should seek to do. Let's pray. Father, as Lord, we look at our lives and we, you know, we have all the different varying sin in our life. Lord, as, a, as a, of the Spirit's working in us, Lord, I pray that there's something we're just wallowing in. If there's a sin, we're, we're letting rain in our lives, and there's a sin that we're allowing it to have influence over us, control over us. So I, I pray we would just come against it, Lord, and say, no. You have set us free from the power, from the rule of sin. And Lord, let us turn to you and run to you. Confess our sins before you. Knowing you aren't going to return a confession and say, I know you'd screw up that bad. How dare you? No, because there is therefore no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, we confess our sins. Lord, we confess those sins that are controlling us. Those sins that are waging war against us and are winning right now. When we confess those sins and we repent, we want to turn away from those and run to you instead. Run to heaven today. Jesus, in your prayer.